most people don't know about full recovery. They come here and they say, that can't be true because if it was, at something that important, I would have heard about it. But it's the most historic place nobody's ever heard of. As a kid, you know, you think every, you know, well, White House is not that special, you know, but, you know, growing up and kind of realizing, wow, this, <laughs> something amazing happened here, you know, it, 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 it hits you finally. I don't remember when, but it hits you. This was just a, a huge event, um, the greatest loss of the United States Army and the, the greatest victory of a native force over a white invading force in the history of the world. If you think about it, the U.S. government is very embarrassed, or otherwise this story would be uh, a much bigger thing in history. So what do you do? Well, the bad stuff you don't like, you just kind of don't say much about it. It's difficult for us as a living community today to think about our challenges in our contemporary lives being a product of the worst fear of the Northwest. We live in a way that is very focused on our past. We say oftentimes that we, we look to our past every day as the example for how to live, but it's not the worst of the old Northwest that we look to as examples of that. In the beginning, there was water, and trees with branches helped guide the people from shadowy depths. They emerged from water at a location we call the Coming Out Place. Since time immemorial, the Algonquin peoples of the Great Lakes have shared stories of water and land, humans and non-humans, migrations and dwelling. Our homelands continue to be so important to us because they hold the dust of our ancestors. The landscape tells those things to us, echoes it all the time. And so we are constantly reminded of who we are and where we came from. For thousands of years, they have dwelled here. They fished from the streams, hunted in the woods, gathered plants, and harvested gardens. They sang and danced, celebrated and mourned, feasted and even starved. They fought wars and made peace through marriage and trade. They remain to this day a living people with a cherished past. Miami, the Old Northwest, the Southern Great Lakes, by any name, this is a living place filled with diverse stories and memories that are embedded across the land. I still think about what this must have been like, you know, just a couple of hundred years ago. And, uh, and it's neat to think about that, to think about whose land this was and, you know, now here we are and we kind of ignore to a great extent what really happened here unless we kind of buckle down and make a point of trying to get reinvolved. In the early 1600s, the Miami people and their Algonquin relations of the Great Lakes, later called the Alliance, first encountered Europeans. Members of the Alliance were from the Shawnee, Delaware, Iroquois, Wyandot, Potawatomi, and Ottawa tribes. By the mid-1600s, Iroquois traders from the east seeking access to new hunting lands, animal pelts, wealth, and captives fought wars against the people of the Great Lakes and Ohio Valley. With the help of the French, they were able to make a new world from the old, forming new communities of diverse populations. At the end of the French and Indian War, Britain's goal was to settle relations between the tribes through the creation of the Proclamation Line. The Proclamation of 1763 stated that the several nations or tribes of Indians with whom Britain is connected and who live under its protection should not be molested or disturbed on lands between the colonies in the east and native lands in the Appalachian Mountains. 
It became very clear that um, the Indians uh, were insistent that they wanted to keep those lines even though the Americans were beginning to move. The proclamation of 1763, like most treaties between the United States and Native Americans, also did not take into account the Native American perspective. Furthermore, the treaties were temporary, pushing the Native Americans west along an ever-shifting frontier. The Indians were uh, misused by, by, the, uh, by the white men, in my opinion. In the aftermath of the Revolutionary War, the Americans claimed the Great Lakes Territory based on the right of conquest. Uh, the government of the United States, which was a very uh, um, young government at that time, uh, would send troops to the Northwest Territory to let the uh, settlers come into the area and settle this land. Uh, the Treaty of Paris had um, uh, set forth the agreement according to the British and the Americans that uh, this land now belonged to the United States of America. In 1789, General Josiah Harmer was sent to quell the almost perpetual violence in the Ohio Territory, prevent illegal settlement, and if possible, take the Miami stronghold of Kikianga, now modern-day Fort Wayne, Indiana. Harmer's men waded through the Ohio backcountry, burning Indian villages and taking captives, proving the United States agenda was not aligned with that of the tribes, nor was an American agenda conducive with long-term peace. The tribal groups had to figure out a means to coordinate all these war parties because they knew they needed numbers um, beyond their usual um, military numbers to defeat these invading armies. And this system was figured out through consensus. And so you have multiple tribal leaders, not just Michiganakwa, helping in this process. Blue Jacket, Bucking the Hollis, other very important leaders from a variety of tribes participated in these coordinated efforts. They were able to push the U.S. Army back across the previously agreed upon border, the Ohio River. The U.S. military had clearly been defeated which prompted General Arthur St. Clair to intercede on behalf of the United States in an attempt to suppress this Native American military resistance. Uh, St. Clair, uh, his mission was to establish a series of forts, supply forts, all the way from Fort Washington, which was already established, up to the Miami stronghold of Kikianga, which is now Fort Wayne, Indiana. The thinking was that if they could um, attack the Miami Indians and Little Turtle, then this land would be safe for settlement. There were just a series of uh, miscalculations and problems that St. Clair encountered on his way up towards Kikianga. Um, one of the greatest was that he was far behind schedule. He didn't have a map uh, that was accurate in any way. The soldiers were tired, hungry, and ill-tempered after spending the day struggling through the Ohio woodlands. So St. Clair had about 1,700 men. and. Um... Almost 300 of them were militiamen from Kentucky, and the rest were the U.S. Army that was at the time. Upon arriving at the Wabash, St. Clair allowed his men to make camp without securing the site or taking precautions for attack. In the meantime, a great Indian confederation was gathering just north of this area and was waiting just for the prime opportunity to attack St. Clair and his troops. St. Clair was not informed of a Native American presence. His officers, believing that the Indians were merely onlookers, failed to realize they were actually part of the Native American alliance. About an hour before day, orders were given for every man to be ready to march. On examination, it was found that three fires, or camps consisting of Potawatomis, had deserted us. We marched until we got to within sight of the fires of St. Clair, 
Then General Blue Jacket began to talk and to sing a hymn as Indians sing hymns. Our power and our numbers bear no comparison to those of our enemy, and we can do nothing unless assisted by our great Father above. I pray now that he will be with us tonight and that tomorrow he will cause the sun to shine out clear upon us. We will take it as a token of good and we shall conquer. Moderate northwest wind, serene atmosphere, and unclouded sky. But the fortunes of this day have been as the cruelest tempest to the interest of the country and this army, and will blacken a full page in the future annals of America. The Alliance planned to attack at dawn on the fourth day of November, 1791. All that remained was for Blue Jacket to position his 1,400 men. He did this under the cover of darkness to prevent drawing attention to his plans. Even though the Indians were accustomed to moving with utmost stealth and silence, to move so many into various positions was no easy task. Advancing in a half-moon formation, the warriors reached the woods at the edge of St. Clair's encampment before daylight. The soldiers were well into their morning routine on the morning of November 4th when Little Turtle gave his warriors the signal to advance at dawn. The Native Americans began the battle by firing from both sides into the main camp. As they fired, warriors fell to the ground to reload. Little Turtle's son-in-law, William Wells, and his Miami warriors picked off artillery gunners as the U.S. soldiers returned fire. The Alliance, encouraged by the confusion in the Army's ranks, pursued the soldiers as they ran. The Alliance continued to fire from three sides while concentrating their shots on active officers easily distinguished by their uniforms. Within an hour's time, the Army was completely uh, surrounded, and within three hours' time, um, Approximately 600 of the 900 soldiers uh, lay dead or were mortally wounded. 120 to 150 women and children who had accompanied the army um, also were, uh, were killed in the onslaught. As the battle raged on, the remaining U.S. Army made an effort to retreat. The bodies of the dead and dying were around us, and the freshly scalped heads were reeking with smoke, and in the heavy morning frost, they looked like so many pumpkins through a cornfield in December. The remnants of St. Clair's force made a miserable trek through the snow towards Fort Jefferson, 25 miles to the south. I fell in with Lieutenant Schaumburg, who, if my recollection serves me, was the only officer of artillery that got away unhurt, with Corporal Mott and a woman who was called Red-Headed Nance. The latter two were both crying. Mott was lamenting the loss of his wife and Nance of an infant child. Schaumburg was nearly exhausted and hung on Mott's arm. I carried his fuse and accoutrements and led Nance. In this sociable way, we came together and arrived at Jefferson a little after sunset. The Alliance, as it had after defeating Harmer the year prior, dispersed, its members returning to their respective tribes to prepare for the winter months ahead. St. Clair's aide, Lieutenant Ebenezer Denny, who, when he first saw the Indians, they were just kind of sitting around and um, after the battle wrote, um, they, uh, they are an enemy that is bred uh, to war from infancy and perhaps superior to an equal number of the best men who can be taken against them. We entertained an unequal war 
and long maintained the contest, too soon rendered doubtful by the superiority of the Indian mode of fighting. The United States government realized that the very future of the United States uh, was possibly at stake at this point, where before that there may have been some confidence that the United States was going to, uh, to continue and uh, survive and uh, prosper and grow. Now all of a sudden the citizens of all the colonies or states at this time uh, began to wonder about um, the the United States government, their representatives, and the Constitution itself. People would prefer to gloss over because it's the dirty underbelly from a lot of people's perspective. But it's the reality of how this country got to, how, to where it is today. It was an empire, and in many ways behaves like an empire today. If people don't like that, it's perhaps because they failed to deal with their past of being an empire. But if you don't acknowledge that you were an empire and you took territory by conquering it, then how can you acknowledge today ways in which your nation behaves in an imperial fashion? On March 5th of 1792, Washington promoted the brash and ambitious Anthony Wayne to head the reformed American Legion. And so Wayne created a new uh, U.S. Army, and that was the birth of the modern U.S. Army. It was the army that Wayne took over. A brave and brilliant commander in many ways, at times Wayne's daring bordered on recklessness, leading Washington to caution the general against such action in a contest with the Native Americans. Anthony Wayne was a uh, very, very careful commander, and um, everybody remembers him now as Mad Anthony Wayne, um, and people kind of conclude from that that that's what he was most really reckless or you know bold and daring or something. Uh, the Indians called him Black Snake because they said he never slept and they could never figure out any way to take him by surprise. For Wayne and his army, the site of the Battle of the Wabash was significant in that it meant reclamation of American honor, honor which had been lost when the Native American alliance overran St. Clair's forces two years prior. So he's now in charge and meeting with much greater success than St. Clair had before that time. Much better troops, much better trained troops, much better support from the United States government. Wayne's remodeled army bore little resemblance to the army St. Clair had led to defeat in 1791. A portion of the army spent December establishing a new fort on the Wabash at the site of the earlier battle. The fort was completed by March of 1794. On the morning of June 30th, 1794, the Alliance attacked a supply train as it left recovery on its way back to Greenville. The survivors raced back to the protection of the fort while the pursuing Alliance poured into the tree line around the fort. A deafening noise of musket and cannon fire filled the air while a heavy fog of gunpowder filled the lungs of the fort's defenders. The Indians kept the battle going through the night, firing from the shelter of the forest. By morning of July 1st, the Alliance, having failed to take the fort, broke its various tribes heading home. On the 24th of August at Fallen Timbers, outside of modern-day Toledo, Ohio, General Anthony Wayne led the bulk of the American forces to victory over the shattered remnants of the Native Alliance. A huge point of this was that when Blue Jacket realized that there was no hope, they rushed back to Fort Miami's, the British fort. 
because the British had promised to support them. And when they got to the British fort, they pounded on the walls, uh, the gates of the fort, and the British refused to open the gates of the fort and said, you're on your own. And, um, and they just knew at that point that they couldn't do it without the support of the British. So Fallen Timbers was a very significant battle um, because uh, it proved the prowess of um, Anthony Wayne's army. The victory at Fallen Timbers effectively ended hostilities and remains the most famous engagement of the Northwest Indian Wars. Almost a year after the Battle of Fallen Timbers, members of the Winnedont, Miami, Chippewa, Delaware, Ottawa, Shawnee, Potawatomi, Wea, Kickapoo, and Kakaskia met at Fort Greenville, Ohio to discuss a peace treaty. The Native Coalition agreed upon a new boundary line, officially ending the conflict and restoring peace to the American frontier. The Algonquin people of the Ohio territories endured the storm that we now call the Northwest Indian Wars. Defeat and the treaty that followed were not the end of their story, but merely the beginning of a new chapter. Unfortunately, this new era of Indian-U.S. relations would culminate in the removal of natives from their ancestral homes. are covered by the white people, and we are jealous that you still intend to make larger strides. We never sold you our land, which you now possess on the Ohio between the Great Kenawha and the Cherokee River, and which you are settling without ever asking our leave or obtaining our consent. It is impossible for us to think as we ought, to whilst we are thus oppressed. I think that the biggest misunderstanding that people have about indigenous people in North America is looking at the past exclusively as a domain of indigenous people is the biggest misconception. We oftentimes start and end our presentations when we're in, the, in our traditional homelands with a statement that is very clear, we are living people with a past, um, but we are not a people of the past. For most Americans, there isn't that consequence because they don't interact with native tribes. They don't really even realize that tribes exist in a real sense. They have a nebulous idea of it, but there's no consequence for that. There's um, no need in their daily life to understand those misconceptions. You can see uh, the relationship between uh, what happened at that time and what's still happening in the world today. That when you have such very different cultures coming together and you have a clash of cultures, um, a lot of times it ends up in, uh, in uh, hostilities, in war. And, uh, and you began to see that uh, maybe there's not a right side and a wrong side. Uh, and that makes it very difficult. Um, so, so you gain a different perspective uh, when you become aware of what actually uh, happened in full recovery. Mm -hmm. 